Okay, for the purposes of our virtual audience, I'm going to say the meeting is now live. Although for all you folks here in the room, the meeting has been live for a few minutes and we appreciate your patience as we work through a very new setup, at least out, outside of City Hall for the city of Brantford. Um, so we are at a hybrid meeting and that means that we have some people here with us at the Civic Center and then others who are able to watch either through Zoom or watching it on the City of Brantford's YouTube page. So welcome to this information meeting about the Mohawk Lake District. I do see a lot of familiar faces in the room today. And I hope besides a few gray hairs on my head, I think many of you also remember me. I'm Tara Tran, the senior planner for the City of Brantford, and I've shepherded this project along for about 10 years now. As someone who is born and raised here in Brantford, it's been an honor to be part of this. This is a project because of the involvement of the public. All your ideas that you've contributed, your questions along the way, it's been inspiring to work on and I value the relationships and the conversations I've had along the way. Before I introduce the Ward 5 counselors, I will cover some meeting expectations to ensure that tonight the discussion goes smoothly and everyone who wants to speak can speak and everyone who is here to listen is respected as well. The total presentation um, at the beginning will be about 35 minutes and we'll have time for questions. Then uh, when it's time for questions, right, then we'll have another 25 minute of a session of presentations and more time for questions. When it is time for questions, we will alternate between those are, who are here in person and those who are attending virtually. We respectfully ask that you keep your questions and comments brief, and we may intervene if you get off topic. Minutes are being taken of this meeting and are also being recorded, as you know, and will be available on the City of Brantford's Neighborhood Meetings YouTube page. Uh, you may view the recording anytime after today. I'd le now like to invite Councillor Samuel to provide some opening remarks. Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here. I also want to um, acknowledge that I have my Ward 5 uh, Councillor Van Tilborg with me tonight, as well as Councillor Martin joining us online. But the most important is I'm so glad to see so many community members here to discuss this exciting project that's going to be so uplifting and so good for the ward and our city as a whole. I thought it would be fitting to first start off the evening by just remembering what the actual vision statement for this project was that was created by the community. So I'm going to share that with you now. So the Mohawk Lake District will be a welcoming place for residents families and visitors of all ages to explore, shop, eat, and learn and gather. Parks and trails along the Mohawk Lake and Canal and throughout the district will provide a beautiful and healthy way to connect with nature. Mohawk Lake District will be where we honor the past, but also a place to be inspired for the future. As a popular destination where history, culture, recreation, and tourism meet. The Mohawk Lake District will be a place of pride in our community. So tonight I want to encourage you to ask questions, to share your thoughts, and to be excited. Because after all, this is your Mohawk Lake District. And I'll pass this back to Tara. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Before we leave this slide, I'll just speak to this photo, which is one I took of Mohawk Lake a few years ago. This beautiful view, along with many other interesting landscapes, attractions, and places of cultural and historical significance, is a reminder of why this area is worth our continued stewardship. So here's the agenda for tonight's meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to share the latest project updates. There are several components um, that are necessary to bring the Mohawk Lake District Plan to fruition someday. Uh, we will be covering a lot of information. And as noted earlier, uh, the first session will be 35 minutes, some questions, then another 25 minutes for our community organizations who have an interest in this area. 
if we can't cover your questions tonight, you can reach out to me through email or phone and I will show those contact details at the end. There are printed agendas for you to follow along. This map shows some of the existing features I mentioned before. There's Mohawk Park, Mohawk Lake and Canal, the 100 year old Murray Street Bridge, the Canadian Military Heritage Museum, and then on Mohawk Street side, Her Majesty's Royal Chapel of the Mohawks and the Woodland Cultural Center Ind Indigenous Preservation Museum. We also know there is archeological evidence of Haudenosaunee settlement. And for those who worked at the former Cockshut Tractor, Massey Harrison, Massey Harris and Mas uh, Massey Ferguson plants, this site has meaning for you as well. These are the places and the stories that make Brantford unique. So the goal here was to create a district which would honor these assets and encourage residents as well as tourists to learn this deep and multicultural heritage. In 2018, the planning department began the process of working with the community to identify a new vision for what we started to call the Mohawk Lake District. Over two years of meetings, surveys, attending neighborhood events, such as barbecues and pancake breakfasts, we created that vision that Councillor Samuel shared with us. I won't read it again, as we just heard it, but it, it is here on the screen. And I hope this vision inspires you like it does me and, the, and you know, we can achieve some of that someday. <clears throat> in addition to the vision statement, the team created a plan which identifies the new land uses, build it, possible buildings, parks, trails that are to be um, that are desired to be included in the district. We tried to include as, and respond to the community's ideas and comments as much as we could. The Mohawk Lake District Plan is a guidance document for the city, and it guides the implementation so that we are strategic and efficient. It takes into consideration the work and interests of other non-city agencies, such as those who will be presenting later tonight, so that we can work together. Victoria Coates, who is another senior planner, will be taking further, uh, talking further about the first step, an official plan amendment that is needed to turn this vision into policy. And she will explain what types of land uses and buildings could be included in the colored blocks shown on the map. Victoria will also explain some of the other administrative next steps that are needed to support future implementation down the road. Well before you see an image like this, which is just conceptual, there are underground pipes, um, new roads, new sidewalks, parking areas that all require a plan and a budget. And these all need to be planned well in advance of actually being built. So one of the items that we're working on is getting a list of what is needed and an approximate cost. And Victoria will tell you more about that. We want to emphasize that we are taking this step by step and it does take time. I do like looking forward to the future, but it is always interesting to remember a little bit about the past. So for those who may be new to the neighborhood, this area includes um, the Haudenosaunee settlement predating the 1800s. And subsequently, the land became factories by the early 1900s. By the 1980s, the industries went out of business and or moved. And eventually the city acquired the properties after taxes weren't paid um, and we acquired it through a failed tax sale. The city then began one of the largest remediation projects in Ontario, maybe even Canada. Remediation is the removal of contaminants from the soil and groundwater. The main contaminants at this site were oil, degreasers, and lead paint. The majority of the soil and groundwater were treated and cleaned on site, and groundwater, um, sorry, and which meant that we didn't have to ship over 5,000 truckloads to a landfill. The Ministry of Environment and Climate Change reviewed the remediation program, and they confirmed that the city achieved the necessary cleanup to allow for the most sensitive form of development which is residential and parkland use. Furthermore, for two to three years after, the city is required to continue monitoring the site and take seasonal laboratory samples to tr track and ensure the site conditions are as expected. 
We have finished monitoring on two of the properties and will continue monitoring one of them for another year. Eventually for new buildings, the city will require geomembrane liners under the foundation and some areas will need to be capped, which means half a meter to one and a half meters of clean soil before grass or other landscaping is laid. Asphalt or concrete barrier, uh, concrete paving are other appropriate barriers. And these barriers will ensure that the site is safely developed. Until the caps are in place and the ground is level, the site remains fenced for safety. Switching gears, another important and unique rehabilitation project is the one to improve water quality in Mohawk Lake and Mohawk Canal. In 2017, the city, uh, with support from the federal government, the city completed background studies to investigate and improve the water quality of Mohawk Lake and Canal. These studies recommended short, medium, and long-term remedial measures. Per the recommendations, the city initiated the design and construction for the short-term me measures, which included three oil and grit separators in 2020, with an additional three to be constructed later this year. Ongoing design of a new stormwater facility in Shallow Creek Park and, a, and the retrofit of the west end of Mohawk Canal is underway with construction anticipated in 2023 and 2024. Moving forward with the remaining medium and long-term measures will be addressed in the city's 10-year capital program subject to council approval. We want to thank everyone who participated, many of you here at the public meetings for that particular project, Mohawk Lake and Canal Rehabilitation, from the public engagement, we heard that the community does desire more recreational use of the lake and canal, but presently that will require a more extensive remedial program that has yet to be decided on or funded. For now, the focus is on improving the immediate water quality by filtering the water runoff that feeds into the lake and canal today. I'd also like to note that there is a citizen working group that meets to hear and provide feedback on the Mohawk Lake Rehabilitation Project. And I believe the chair of that committee, she, she was planning on attending today, she, perhaps she's not here yet. Um, her name is Joy O'Donnell. And if you have an interest in, in joining this group, you can speak to Joy to learn, with Joy to learn more. The last brief update I will give before I turn over the reins to Victoria is to provide an update on the Cockshut Office and Timekeepers Building. These structures are designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. The photo on the left shows what the buildings did look like in 2004, but unfortunately a fire in 2012 destroyed much of it and uh, the city had to just demolish uh, much of the building and hoard what did remain. Water damage and exposure to the elements continues to deteriorate the buildings. So pending council approval, a restoration plan includes brick repairs, stair repairs, and replacing and restoring much of the wood structure, flooring, and siding so that um, we can preserve what, what does remain. Later on, you'll hear future plans, uh, a future proposal from the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre who hopes to incorporate these structure into a new design and facility. I'll now give it over to Victoria to continue explaining the official plan amendment. Thanks, Tara. Uh, my name is Victoria Coates and I'm also a senior planner at the city of Brantford, uh, working on the implementation of the Mohawk Lake district plan. So as Tara mentioned, one of the very important steps to implementing the district plan is to complete an official plan amendment. So the Mohawk Lake district plan illustrates a conceptual land use structure for the area. And while it has been approved by council, it doesn't have the legal authority to uh, permit the envisioned land uses or to provide uh, the direction that's needed to make this vision a reality. So the city's official plan is the document with that legal authority. So it needs to be amended to include the specific land use policies that will guide how land in the district may be used and developed in the future. Um, so the Mohawk Lake District is divided into three distinct areas shown here. Um, the gateway area, the culture and community destination area, and the Mohawk Lake and Park recreational area. So through the official plan amendment, policies that are specific to each of these three areas are proposed to be added to the official plan by amending a modified policy area. 
So that's just an area of the city where there are some special policies that apply in addition to the other policies of the official plan. So the modified policy area for the district will include policies that will establish the vision for each of these three areas and uh, will provide direction on things like permitted land uses, building height, and key features that are really central to the Mohawk Lake District vision. So I'll go through each of those areas and explain the types of policies that are proposed through the official plan amendment. So the first area is the gateway area at the western part of the district, and it includes the Greenwich Street corridor. It's envisioned to be a, a welcoming entrance and transition from the downtown into the district. Um, so through the official plan amendment, it will permit a range of uses in the gateway area, uh, consisting of mixed use, residential, and commercial uses, office uses, and institutional uses that are going to generate activity along this corridor. In terms of building heights, taller buildings are envisioned at the intersection of Greenwich Street and Clarence Street South. Um, and that will be the sort of key intersection to signify that you're entering the district. So a minimum building height of six stories would be required here. And then in the rest of the gateway area, there would be mid-rise buildings of three to six stories in height. Um, buildings in this area will have a strong focus on urban design to really define this area as a gateway to the district. And then finally, the gateway area will be supported by an enhanced streetscape along Greenwich Street. Um, so that will include vehicle travel lanes, parking, um, as well as a sidewalk and cycle track on the south side and a multi-use path on the north side. The next area is the culture and community destination area, um, which is the largest area for redevelopment in the district. And this includes the former Greenwich Mohawk brownfield site. So the culture and community destination area is really envisioned to be the heart of the district. Um, it will provide amenities for not only the local neighborhood, but it will also serve to establish the district as a vibrant cultural destination within Brantford. So this plan here sort of zooms into the culture and community destination area of the approved Mohawk Lake District plan, and it illustrates the conceptual land uses that are envisioned here. So you can see there are proposed areas for uh, new parks and trails that are shown in green. And later you'll hear from some of the museum groups and community partners who plan to relocate to these spaces. To allow these types of uses on these former industrial lands. Um, for residential and mixed use buildings in, the, in this area, heights of three to six stories would be permitted um, with the potential for some slightly taller mixed use buildings of up to eight stories in height in uh, some key locations along Mohawk Street, Greenwich Street, or the new Main Street, which is one of the key public realm elements um, within the culture and community destination area. So policy direction for all of the key public realm elements will also be included through the official plan amendment. So this is the uh, new Main Street that's shown here. It would be aligned with Emily Street to the south and the uh, Drummond Street pedestrian bridge to the north. And ideally it will cross over the existing rail spur line. So the main street's gonna provide uh, pedestrian, bicycle and vehicle connectivity, and will also be designed to support mixed use developments with active uses on the ground floor. Am I having technical difficulties? Okay, so this uh, drawing is an artist's rendering of what that new Main Street could look like. So you can see there are wide sidewalks, there's lots of street trees. Um, on the left side, you can see mixed use buildings um, where there's some ground floor commercial uses. So you can see the storefronts there um, with residential uses above. And on the right side, you can see the uh, Cockshot office portico. And again, you'll hear more from the Canadian Industrial Heritage Center about their plans for that site. And another important feature of the culture and community destination area is a waterfront promenade along the south side of Mohawk Canal. So the promenade will be a focal point in the district, creating an enhanced active transportation corridor along Greenwich Street, 
Um, there'll be a wide pedestrian boardwalk along the waterfront edge, a multi-use path along the north side of Greenwich Street, and a uh, bike lane and sidewalk along the south side of the street. Um, abundant landscaping is going to provide a, a green street edge to complement the existing natural area along the canal. Um, so this rendering shows what that waterfront promenade could look like. You can see that green street edge um, along the canal. Um, in this view, you can see the boardwalk right next to the canal. Um, that's also supported by a multi-use path. And then like the main street, the waterfront promenade will be supportive of mixed use development with active uses at grade. So you can see here that could be you know, restaurants on the ground floor with patios right next to the sidewalk. And then the last feature in this area is a large park fronting Greenwich Street and abutting the north side of the existing rail spur line. So this park could be used to host major events like Canada Day celebrations or other community led celebrations. And it's really going to help contribute to establishing the district as a center of tourism and recreation in the city. So these photos show how the large park could be used for large events or for passive recreation. So you can see there could be lots of landscaping and paths. Um, there could be things like public art or an amphitheater or stages to um, help host events. And then the last area is the Mohawk Lake and Park Recreational Area. And now this is envisioned to remain as a park and recreational area. Um, it could be enhanced by some trail improvements, canal crossings, uh, public open space or other improvements that are all focused on providing um, additional opportunities for recreation. Um, the official plan amendment will not permit um, any additional land uses here. It's just going to be establishing uh, support for this vision. And uh, the official plan amendment is also going to establish a policy that will address issues of land use compatibility. So since the district abuts active industrial uses, um, in developing the Mohawk Lake District Plan, we did a land use compatibility assessment where we looked at things like uh, odor, vibration, air quality, and noise impacts. And through that assessment, it was determined um, at a high level that all of the proposed land uses can be located here safely in the district. Um, but when we get to the stage where we have more detailed development proposals um, for sensitive land uses, so like residential uses, um, development proponents will need to address the recommendations and findings of that assessment that was completed um, in order to um, make any you know, mitigation measures to make sure um, that land use compatibility is addressed. So that might, uh, might include something like installing certain types of windows in a new building to make sure noise levels are appropriate. And then the last component of the official plan amendment will be to address urban design. Um, and that's going to be done by including a policy um, to ensure that any new development or public realm improvements that happen in the district are consistent with the city's urban design manual. Uh, the existing manual contains most of the guidance that is needed to ensure good quality design in the district, but some additional guidance would be helpful to um, ensure that there are some specific guidelines related to the district that will support that vision. So in particular, there'll be guidance added um, about the different streetscapes in the district. So details about the new main street, for example. So in addition to the official plan amendment, another step that's really critical to implementing the Mohawk Lake District Plan is going through a preliminary draft plan of subdivision process for the former Greenwich Mohawk Brownfield site. So staff is working with IBI Group, who's a planning and engineering consultant on this task. And this is the process where we're really starting to get into the nitty gritty details, technical details, um, determining exactly how much land the city needs to retain for those municipal infrastructure projects, what types of approvals are gonna be required, how much those projects will cost, um, and exactly how much land we will have available to sell to community organizations or other uh, private developers in order to bring the district to life. Um, so one of the key deliverables through this process is going to be a plot plan, which is a technical drawing that's going to lay out the location of all roads, including um, any new roads or road widenings. So for example, the plot plan is going to need to create or lay out the land that would be needed to create that new main street, um, including any land that might be needed for some safety measures to enable the crossing of that, of the spur line, um, or to implement the new waterfront promenade, the Greenwich Street right away is likely going to need to be widened so that we can fit in uh, the boardwalk and the sidewalks and uh, the paths. So that plot plan will lay out all of that land that's required to accommodate those elements. 
The plan is also going to include the location and dimensions of all lots or blocks that could be um, sold either to developers or to community partners or lots that would be retained by the city in order to develop the trails and the parks or other uh, municipal priorities. And then the other main deliverable in this preliminary draft plan of subdivision process will be to take that plot plan and all of those um, infrastructure projects that are required and to put some numbers to them. So we'll be preparing high level cost estimates for any required class environmental assessment processes for municipal infrastructure projects, um, cost estimates for the actual construction of those projects, and then an estimate for the cost of an, uh, a formal draft plan of subdivision application, which would legally create those lots or any other uh, planning act applications that might be necessary. So once this process is complete, we'll be able to go back to council with the full picture of the different approval processes and costs um, that are necessary for turning the Mohawk Lake District plan into a reality. And at that point, we will be better positioned to not only move forward with those infrastructure projects, but also to move forward with uh, selling land to community partners and developers. So there are a couple other things that are going on that may impact the different lots the city needs to retain in the district and the lots that could be available to be sold. So one of those things is the work of the Community Heritage and Cultural Space Task Force. So council created this task force with a mandate to determine the desire for and feasibility of developing a community heritage and cultural space. And this type of space might include a consolidated museum facility, space for performances or other space for community uh, use. Um, and the Mohawk Lake District was considered to be a potential site of interest for this space. And council had decided to retain the parcel shown here off of Greenwich Street right next to the large park for uh, that type of facility. Um, now the task force through their work, they consulted with stakeholders and uh, the, there was limited interest from the museum community in this type of space. Most of the interest came from performance arts uh, groups and uh, council has already invested in the proposed cultural hub at One Market to provide performance space. So actually at its meeting this afternoon, the task force um, made a recommendation to cease further investigation into this type of space and to disband the task force. So that recommendation will be considered later by council. And if that's approved, this has the potential to free up these lands in the district for other priorities. And the last topic I want to update you on is housing. So new housing is really a key component to ensuring the success of the Mohawk Lake District. So housing brings the new residents that are needed to support any new commercial uses, institutional uses, um, and new residents are needed to animate the park and the streets and the waterfront promenade. So as I mentioned previously, the official plan amendment will permit different types of residential uses in multi-story buildings. And this housing might be built by private developers, some might be built by the city of Brantford, and some may be built by um, community partners. But it's important to note that the official plan permits the use of housing, but it's not a tool that can be used to regulate the type of housing, uh, or sorry, the tenure of housing. So whether there are rental units or condo units, um, and it's not a tool that can be used to regulate the cost of housing either. Um, this just means that there could be a mix of housing types in the district. So the city's housing department is completing an ongoing project that is looking at new housing opportunities citywide. Um, as you probably know, there is a great need for affordable housing in Brantford, um, like many other Ontario municipalities. So in Brantford, there are over 1,200 households that are on the wait list for affordable housing, um, with applicants waiting at least two years for an affordable housing offer. And depending on the household type, some applicants wait over eight years for affordable housing. So to help address this need, council has directed staff to investigate the potential for building new affordable housing on municipally owned properties across the city. Now that does include uh, in the Mohawk Lake District. So the housing department is currently completing that investigation at these various sites across the city. And the model of housing that's being considered is, is mixed income rentals. So this type of investigation is considering things like the type and size of building that could be appropriate, the mix of unit types and sizes. So, you know, one bedroom or two bedroom units, uh, the amount of parking and amenity area that would be needed, um, the size of land needed, and where appropriate, location, oh, sorry, appropriate locations could be for these different uh, developments. 
So further community consultation will occur before council makes a decision on whether to retain land in the district to develop uh, mixed income rentals. Um, and there will also be community consultation on the other sites in other areas of the city um, that are also being considered for this type of development. And then before we open the floor up to questions, I'll just summarize all of the, the next steps in implementing the Mohawk Lake District Plan. So the rehabilitation of the Mohawk Lake and Canal continues. Um, the next project consists of installing a stormwater pond in Shallow Creek Park, and planning for other medium and long-term measures is ongoing. For the heritage structures at 66 Mohawk Street, uh, repair work to restore and prevent further deterioration is planned pending uh, budget approval from council. The official plan amendment application will be presented at a statutory public meeting in front of uh, the planning committee as required by the Planning Act um, before council will make its decision on that application. So we're targeting bringing this forward in the first quarter of this year and uh, we'll be sending out a notice to the mailing list of uh, anyone interested in the Mohawk Lake District so you can stay up to date on that. Um, we're also currently working through that preliminary draft plan of subdivision process um, and that will result in that plot plan showing the potential division of land um, within the Greenwich Mohawk site will also result in those cost estimates for um, municipal infrastructure projects and any approval processes. And then we'll be presenting that information to council for consideration and direction on the next steps. And we expect that that will be completed by the summer of this year. Um, the Community Heritage and Cultural Space Task Force, uh, will council will consider their recommendation to disband that task force. And again, that has the potential to free up some land in the district for other priorities. And then lastly, the housing department is completing that citywide investigation into sites um, that could be appropriate for mixed income re rentals, including in the district. And further community consultation will be held on the details about what potential building could look like an appropriate site within the district could, could be. Um, and then council will make a decision on whether to retain land in the district for this type of development, considering that input from the community. I'll turn it back over to Tara. Thank you, Victoria. We know we, you just heard a lot of information. So we'll now take 10 minutes for questions. And again, we'll alternate between those who are in the room and for those attending virtually. If you have a question, both in the virtual environment or here, we just ask that you raise your hand and someone will come around with a microphone. It is important that we use the microphone because the folks at home and won't be able to hear you otherwise. If we are asking any of our staff members to help us answer those questions, we'll ask you to come to the table opposite myself and Victoria. And once again, I will just ask everyone a friendly reminder to keep your comments and questions brief and on topic. So I'll ask for anyone in the room, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And I see a few, so Alan, come around. and. We'll start one at a time. And again, I'll be switching over to virtual after the first question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremiah. Uh, and my question is the multi-usage homes, that idea of commercial on the bottom, uh, residents on the top. Um, it's sort of a multi-layered question. I'll keep it brief, of course. Um, is it rental? Is it purchased? Is it ownership or is it rental? of that residential housing? Thanks for your question. Um, so the housing that was shown, the mixed use development with commercial on the ground floor and residential mm -hmm. above, it's, um, it's something that could be developed by private developers or community partners. And it's, it's not something we can control for in terms of whether it's rental or owner, it would be up to, up to that developer. That's not something we can control through the official plan amendment. So then my follow-up question is how many residential homes single dwelling homes is that again a developer's decision how many individually homes we're just one family if you will living in that home how many of them are we hoping to have so so if you're thinking about single detached dwellings wouldn't be a, a type of use that's permitted here so we're we're looking at multi-story um, residential buildings in terms of how many um that will be something that will come a lot a lot later in the, in the process in terms of development. Um, and it will depend on different, uh, different site constraints, you know, how much parking you can fit, how much uh, 
um, amenity areas needed. So those details are, are well down the road. Thanks for that question. I'll now ask Darlene um, to let us know, is there anyone on the virtual environment who wishes? Thanks, Tara. We have, a, we have um, about nine attendees. Uh, Mr. Andrew DeJonk here has a question. Andrew, if you wanna go ahead with your question. Andrew, can you hear us? Okay, he might be having some other. Okay, we'll go with the next question. Next. Elizabeth Goss. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Um, my question is, what do you mean by affordable housing? How does the city define what affordable housing is? How many affordable housing units are already located near the Mohawk Lake District compared to other parts of the city? Um, so in terms of looking at affordable housing, this is a, a citywide investigation that the housing department is undertaking. Those details in terms of the number of units um, and what that makeup might look like is still something that the housing department is working on. Um, so we just don't have those details available right now, but there will be further community consultation um, for this site, um, as well as other sites across the city. Um, I, I hope that I answered your question. I think you did have multiple points there. So if I missed something, uh, let me know. Oh, can you define what the city means by affordable housing? Sure. Actually, we have um, Mary, who's going to step in from our housing department to assist with that. Hi, thank you so much for your question. Affordable housing is anything that's at 80% or less of the average market rent set by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, thank you, Mary. We appreciate everyone's patience as we work back and forth and certainly staff can be made available to further clarify, but we'll move on to a next in-person question. So again, we'll ask for those who had a question, raise your hand and Alan or, or sorry, Councillor Samuel. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rick Gerard. I live at uh, Crandall Lab, just down from there. So I don't think it's a stretch if I make a remark that we want you to put housing in but we want this to be ownership for the simple reason that we want people to take a part of this land and be a part of it. When you rent it, or if you put in rental of any kind like that in housing, the person's renting, they don't own the land, they don't own the house. So you're not promoting a tax base to increase and cherish that land that's now been rehabilitated, rejuvenated. Taxpayer money has been put into this land to do all this, to make it something really special. So let's keep going and make the housing development that go in there, whether it's condo complexes, like we have over here in area, condo housing, like we have on Coburn Street, I promote, and I'm sure a lot of Eagle Place people do, we want ownership, housing, multi-layer, I don't care, but we want affordable housing, uh, rental, no. Now, I realize it's not a question, but you did say we could have comments. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for that comment and, and speaking it so eloquently. I'll ask now for a virtual question. Um, Andrew is having technical difficulty. He asked me if I would read the question to you. His question is, what is the reasoning behind the trail development between the Alfred Watts ruins and the landfill? I'll take the answer to that. Um, so the question was, what is the reasoning behind the, uh, 
the trail that goes from the Alfred Watts ruins to the landfill. We don't have any members of parks with us today, so I'll just um, attempt to answer that and we can follow up. Uh, there are some trails uh, informally back there. So whether that's a formal city, um, you know, maintained trail or not, I'll have to double check. Um, but we do hope to promote, um, you know, enjoyment of the natural space in and around the district. And it does include one day hope, um, you know, inviting people to safely get to the Alfred Watts ruins. Uh, I will follow up with Parks to get more of an answer on that one. Okay, we'll now go to anyone else who has a question here in the room. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, I'm, uh, I'm Tony DeBrun and uh, my questions are to board the lake. Uh, can someone tell me what the water quality now is and what uh, the time frame to bring that lake into recreational and shoreline recreation for the public. Thank you for your question. I, we actually do have a staff member who is the project lead for the Mohawk Lake Rehabilitation. Nahed is attending virtually. So if Nahed can get himself organized. There he Hello, is. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you in the head. Okay. I, I, so water quality now at the lake is contaminated, but it's not hazardously contaminated. So it's uh, it's need remediation. I do like they we we uh, if uh, we posted on the website the studies that we have completed and where we describe exactly the table uh, and level of water quality contamination and in the lake, but it is contaminated at this point. And what the time frame for remediation? So we we are starting with the, some remediation measures. At this point, we have completed three all grid separators, which are very very small. And we doing the 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 two big projects for remediation, which is the Shallow Creek Park and West Canal. So we are targeting to uh, start construction this year and next year. And this will. Uh, improve uh, a, the, the water quality coming to the lake uh, significantly. Okay, thanks, Nahed. We'll also allow Jennifer Elliott to step in as well. So Jennifer Elliott, can you introduce yourself? Good evening, Jennifer Elliott, Director of Engineering Services. So yes, as Nahed was saying, um, the Mohawk Lake remediation project is a multi-year project. It has identified multiple years. Um, and so in the beginning stages, we were, we've installed um, oil grit separators in which to clean up um, portions of the storm sewer entering into the canal and into the lake. We have three more to be installed this coming year in 2023, pending council approval. We will also be putting in a storm water management pond in Shallow Creek Park this year. And then we will move into looking at all of the other um, remediation recommendations that came out of the study. Thanks, Jennifer. So I know the question was how, the question was how many years will it take in which to be remediated? No, I, would you... say, I would say within the next 10 years, hopefully, or less than that. Sorry, now can you, Yourself, we can't clear. within the next 10 years or less than that within the next subject, to, subject to budget approval correct the next 10 years is the extent of the remediation pro no it's the extent of the remediation projects that have been identified so but the question i had was um the quality of the water and what for the fish the aquatic life that is in the lake at this moment it, it is contaminated at this point like it's full of sediment, the lake and canal is full of sediments. And uh, we, we um, by the strategy of the proposed by the EA is to restore the lake by improving the quality of the water incoming to the lake. 
Yes. So the, all the remediation projects that are identified is to improve the stormwater quality that is coming into the lake. So through the stormwater system, through the groundwater um, to restore that in the lake. But so the right now, the contaminants that are there, you're saying those contaminants are- We have, we have project for the contouring and sediment removal of the lake, but this will be the next step after we constructing the, those Shallow Creek Park and West Canal. So it's coming. I will get the answer to your question, sir, and I will I will respond to you. Do you know the answer to that, Nahad? Have you heard that question? No, I can. So, can Question, the contaminants that are in the lake, is there an issue with the fish in the lake if someone were to catch a fish? And mm, yes, they are not suited for consumption. Okay. They're not suitable for consumption. Yeah. Yeah. What, about, what about swimming? Even swimming, still not. It still it can, 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 uh, it can be dangerous for a human body. At this point, stay, stay out or stay away. It's stay out at this point till we do it at the remediation. We can certainly get more information um, about that, and you can find all the reports that Nahed uh, referred to on the City of Brantford's website. Just search Mohawk Lake Rehabilitation. Um, so we have an additional answer back here to that question. Hi, Tara. Sorry I was late getting here. I know Tara introduced me. I'm the chair of the Mohawk Lake Working Group. I'm ahead. I'm just going to try to clarify because you're hard to hear through the system. Mm -hmm. um, Mohawk Lake is, is contaminated. It is not toxic. Um, so we do have like 27 species of fish living in there, which is a good sign that it is a healthy ecosystem. But we do have a lot of sand and gravel and salts and contaminations flowing into Mohawk Lake from the surrounding area, the streets and that sort of thing, is why the oil and grit separators have to stop the contamination. That's what we're trying to do first. And then we'll remove contaminants. Uh, what is Nahed was referring to is um, there are some contaminants that this needs to be removed, but again, it's hot contaminated, no more than any other inner lake, inner city lake situation. Um, once we get the, the, the dirt and the salts stop flowing into there, it will naturally clean itself as well. It's not swimmable. Chances are it will never be swimmable. We looked at trying to reach blue water quality. Uh, it's a matter of money, and it's a lot of money to get it to blue water swimmable conditions. So we're not there yet. Maybe in 20 years we might get to swimmable, but that's, you know, that's kind of tough. Um, in terms of eating the fish, um, I wouldn't recommend it, but I don't believe M MNRA said um, that it would be toxic. It's just not recommended to eat it on a daily basis or anything like that. Thank you, Joy. Um, so that is Joy O'Donnell, the chair of the Citizen Committee. It's now time for a virtual question. I don't know why it does that. Thanks, Tara. Um, we do have a question from Jenna. Is it Levi or Levy? Jenna, if you can forward with your Hi, name. thank you. Um, I just have two questions. So I believe a trail is being discussed between the cultural space um, area and Mohawk Park crossing through the, uh, I believe it's called the Glebe Farm Indian Reserve. I'm just wondering if this has been approved or if there's still discussion about this trail. Um, and also, um, there is a community center, I believe, within Mohawk Park. Uh, I'm not sure who owns it, but I'm wondering if there's plans to make uh, greater use of that building. Thank you. I'll start with the answer on the trail there. Um, the trail through the Glebe Lands is not part of the Mohawk Lake District plan, so um, that isn't something that we are moving forward with. But with regards to Mohawk Park, I'll allow Jennifer Elliott to answer. Do 
Good evening. Yes, so the pavilion in Mohawk Park, there is a capital project in which to do some upgrades to that pavilion, um, which would include HVAC, the air conditioning, roofing, and some stormwater drainage. So that will be um, completed within the next two years so that that building will, will be more a more useful building throughout all the seasons. Thanks for the question. Uh, is there anyone else in the room? I see some hands, yeah. Actually, yes, I'm Robert Birch and I live in Eagle Place. Uh, I've had a plan for over 20 years on developing the brownfields between Greenwich and Mohawk. Um, it would be 15 to 2,000 apartments and restaurants, be a multi-use thing. And I was shut down a few times. I've talked to you, Tara. Um, I would like to develop the brownfields. Uh, the people that have bought land in there, I would like to get it back from them because they're, they, the Lionsdown Center would have ample area allocated to them. The natives would have the ample, ample area delegated to them. And we would make it a viable area in which to live. It would be not to give away the exact plan. It would be like an Epcot North. Uh, everybody could live there, work there. And I also have had another idea of probably having a commute area to get possibly to Oakville in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I think it's a viable plan. I had a model up until five years ago when I had a oh, my laundry tops overflowed. <laughs> but uh, it, it would be a whole area. There'd be three to four cul-de-sacs or uh, gardens where there would be a bunch of activities around there. There would be uh, theaters, a live theater, restaurants, the whole bit. I've been trying to get it to council for 15 years. I've talked to six councillors, five of which are still elected to council, and none of them talked to me. Okay, thank you, Mr. Birch. I have another staff member who will assist. Her name is Heidi DeVries. She'll introduce herself. Hi, Mr. Birch. I'm Heidi DeVries. I'm now a general manager. Uh, with a, a fairly long title, but I, I met you before as the director of what was then legal and real estate services. Um, and I was aware of your proposal, which was submitted to Ron Gasparetto, our manager of real estate, and was presented to the task force that was responsible for determining um, potential uses for this site uh, through an expression of interest process. So that was actually presented. It was not adopted by the task force. And so Apparently I'm very out of shape because the walk from the back of the room here has left me out of breath. Uh, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but the presentations you'll hear tonight from community groups were community groups who also presented their ideas and there were a lot of amazing ideas to that particular task force. And those were the ones that were recommended to proceed. But we, we thank you for your continued interest and for the vision that you have for this area. And um, thank everyone here who, who shares the vision that you're going to see here tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions virtually? We don't have any hands raised, um, Tara, but um, I will go to having technical difficulties. Um, we have Jamie Crick. Jamie, do you have any questions for us today? No, actually, I'm just enjoying the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go to Mr. Duncan Ross. Do you have any questions for us this evening? And while you're getting that sorted out, mate, I might see a hand raised in the back. Councillor Samuel, do you have the microphone? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, has Six Nations of the Grand River been consulted or been involved in this? And I don't see any of the representatives from Six Nations here, both the elected council and the Confederacy Council. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I will actually ask Heidi.
the question is, um, were members of Six Nations or uh, the Band Council of Six Nations um, consulted on our this project? So I actually, uh, I only have that information from you, Tara, in terms of the Mohawk Lake District Plan. Um, so I can't answer that. Specific. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, just briefly, as part of creating the plan, we did reach out to members of um, Six Nations Band Council as well as staff to um, hear their feedback on the Mohawk Lake District Plan. We also reached out to others um, in community organizations such as the Woodland Cultural Center, um, as well as the Six Nations Tourism to also hear any comments that they had to share. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Victoria. I was just gonna add that we've also worked closely with the, the CAP team. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get this acronym right. Consultation and accommodation process. What is it? Consultation and accommodation process. Team. Thank you, okay. Um, yeah, so we, throughout the development of the Mohawk Lake District Plan, we met with that team several times um, and we've kept them up to date on um, the implementation of this plan. Um, so we did in, in share the, the details that we presented here today um, with that team and we'll uh, continue to, to keep them involved in this as well. And just to add to that, um, representatives of the Six Nations also sit on the Mohawk Lake remediation team. And I know Joy in the back uh, has gotten quite familiar with those representatives. And we are very, very grateful for their contributions to that project as well. Thanks everyone, yep. Are there any other questions virtually, Darnie? We also have a Tabitha Curley. Tabitha, if you could um, proceed with any questions that you have. Sorry, I don't have a question. Thank you very much. Then seeing more in the room. I'm just wondering if you um, did an assessment on the impact that this project would have on um, the local wildlife. So I'll speak to the Mohawk Lake District Plan and then um, we'll, we can answer more questions on the Mohawk Lake side. So for the Mohawk Lake District Plan, as part of our technical studies to support the plan, we did do a, an environmental impact study and that just examined the plant and animal um, species in the area to highlight any ones that are of concern or at risk. And it was determined that there are no uh, species or um, habitat that we would prevent us from moving forward with the Mohawk Lake District Plan. As part of any applications to actually build anything specific, they would then have to complete a more specific environmental impact assessment to be sure that there are no impacts to their specific development. Um, there is There was an environmental assessment also completed as part of the Mohawk Lake rehabilitation component and that environmental assessment report is available on the city's website um, to get more details about that component. Good, thank you. Um, if, We'll just take the one last question and then this will be the last one before we wrap up to go on to the next part of our meeting. My question is whether in considering the development of these lands, are you taking into context the uh, amount of affordable housing that exists across the city and how this neighborhood compares and should there be more affordable housing or not? Uh, because I believe it sh there should be for people who need it, but it should be spread across the city in an even way, not putting a burden on one area. So have you taken that into consideration in your plans? So that's um, right now at this point, council has directed um, the housing department to, to look at this citywide. So they're looking at a bunch of different sites across the city where the, the city owns the land. Um, and at the end of the day, staff is gonna present that back to council 
Um, but that type of information is something that, that council would be considering when they're, they're making their decisions about where affordable housing would go. It, it's, it's, early, it's early in the process, so no, no decisions have been made about affordable housing. It's just really an investigation stage. We're just uh, responding to council's uh, direction to take a look at that. So that's the type of information that you know, staff can give back to council when they make their decision. We're good, I'm an amateur. Um, I think if you live in Eagle Place, you already know the answer to the question. Um, I think Eagle Place really pulls its weight when it's come to helping people. Um, you've done it time and time and time again. We're a big city, and I think that's what you're recognizing. Uh, we've just grown, we've had boundary growth and all that thing. And uh, I think what, what I've heard in the past, while this project's been moving forward, I believe I heard it again in previous elections and the last time around, you, you do want, you're not saying I don't want affordable housing, but you're saying we've had enough. We have enough here. And you, you've always had, and I mean you've always had from Margaret Chesney Smith's era, uh, when there was some proposals once before, You've always had that mindset that you wanted this to be the beacon and not the burden. You've got the burden and that you wanted to share it. Again, you, I, think, I think we all know we got friends and relatives. I think we, most of us uh, from with Eagle Place Roots and quite frankly, I'm an Eastward boy, wrong side of Shallow Creek. But um, we know what it's like to grow up with not much. We don't wanna hurt, say to somebody you don't deserve a roof over your head and food in your belly. We, that's what we want. But I think we've all recognized, and when you do the math, and the math is there, I don't think it'll take long for the city to go through the numbers and realize that Eagle Place particular, Ward 5 as a whole, probably has 62 to 63 percent of all of it, closely followed by Ward 1, and then it drops off almost to infinite numbers, like just almost nothing. So um, I know what you're saying. I think staff will know, but that report will come to us. You'll have another chance when it comes. We're just dealing with the zoning to say, this is what you guys have, have been championing for through a 15 year process. And if you're comfortable with this, the zoning will be done. And this stuff that you're mentioning now, we will follow through with and, and look into it to address um, what I believe you're speaking loudly about. Oh, I hear I got three no votes right here. And uh, if Councillor uh, Councilor Newman and Councillor Wall in the room as well, just to, to say that we, the councillors from that have come into Ward 5 have a never ending seeming commitment to this, to this ward. I don't know what it is, but we really bond. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, we'll now close the question period for now. There will be another one afterwards, so. Um, but we will move on to our community organizations. So I'll invite the first community organization to get, um, get ready. Go ahead, Bob, and then I'll introduce you. So a reminder that each of these community organizations will introduce themselves and share their updates. Each will take five minutes. After each presentation, I will allow one to two quick questions, um, but I just want to make sure we don't get off track so that the subsequent uh, organizations can present as well. So the first is the Canadian Military Heritage Museum, which has been leasing and operating at the only building remaining at the larger portion of the site on Greenwich Street. Bob Ian is the chair of the Canadian Military Heritage Museum and will give this presentation. I will turn it over to Bob Ian now. Thank you, Tara. Good evening. Um, I'd just like to take you back to, uh, I don't have any visuals, so, so you just leave it at that. Um, I'd just like to take you back to where we started from to where we are now and just show that, uh, you know, there is success stories in this community and, uh, and, and actually we think 
The people of Eagle Place have waited for so long, they deserve so, some of these projects to get on the move. So I just like to say the Canadian Military Heritage Museum was also a, a vision. It was envisioned uh, by a dedicated group of volunteers uh, comprised mostly of veterans and uh, military history enthusiasts, and it was spearheaded by a well-known person in Brantford named Derek Pike. He was a D-Day veteran. Negotiating with the property owner in 1992-93, uh, this small group of enthusiastic uh, volunteers acquired the lease for 347 Greenwich Street, where we currently are. It was a 13,000 square foot abandoned uh, uh, dirty pattern shop. It was a shell of a building. Uh, despite the obstacles, the cleanup crews worked long hours tackling decades of grime and dirt layered on the floor and walls, removing the current tenants of pigeons and rodents. With a design in mind, an, an interior layout was created that could house and present exhibits and displays reflective of a museum and suitable for public viewing. So what I'm going to say, show is that these things are possible in this area. Realizing that this vision had to be more in 1993, the volunteers undertook the task of having uh, the museum registered as a charitable nonprofit organization. And on April 9th, 1994, that's the anniversary of, uh, of, the, uh, of Vimy, the ribbon was cut for the official grand opening for this new museum in the city of Brantford. So this is, this is a, a marvelous attraction for your city. The years ahead, they weren't easy for us, uh, we struggled to maintain uh, a presence in the city, working hard to keep the museum alive. We'd have bills in the uh, in the winter time for two thousand dollars for for gas, and we'd have three thousand dollars in the bank. So, it was it was a committed effort by the dedicated volunteers that eventually secured the museum as a strong and viable facility, entrenching it as a must see de destination site. And, and I'll stress that it's a must-see destination site, and that's something that could be continued on with other cultural heritage and, and uh, educational organizations. Present museum is a result of a healthy development of collections and, and uh, a commitment to continually refreshing ex exhibitions and displays, as you know if you've been there. Um, we're unable to uh, structurally expand in size, so what's been done has been on the interior uh, we've been uh, assisted by the city of Brantford and grants and uh, and foundations and, and a generous benefactor. We have done such projects as a two level environmental control archive room, which will protect the, the, the precious artifacts, the ephemeral things, the cloth and the paper that's uh, that's your history from this community. Uh, 218, uh, 2018 saw the installation of a new accessible main entrance, two vehicle entrances, at the rear side of the building and a complete repair and painting of the exterior walls. Uh, we put in LED light fixtures. So you can see there's been a lot of things bring us into the 21st century. We closed for a year and a half during COVID. So that gave us a chance to do a lot of things that, uh, that couldn't be done uh, during the usual closing time. It was a busy year in 2020 uh, with the assistance of the city of Brantford um, new washrooms, accessibility washrooms were completed and a renovation upgrade to the back building uh, uh, and construction of a kitchen, storage area, new boardroom. Uh, so many things have been done. Uh, we've had parking in the front. These are the type of things that are, are a possibility for, for uh, some of these projects to go ahead. Uh, and, uh, and if you've driven past, you've seen a new metal gate that's at the front uh, of the building. Um, Last week, a, com uh, a compact mobile filing system was installed in, the, in our archiving room, allowing for expanded and improved storage in an environmentally controlled room. And this will enhance the uh, cataloging and digitization of the collections. Um, this just like has taken us into the 21st century. We believe the current museum honors the vision, you know, and the intention of its founders. And with this commission of a strong volunteer board, and aided with the support from the County of Brant and especially the city of Brantford, upper levels of government, members, donations, and generous benefactors and grants. And uh, the museum today is a first-class venue that is uh, an attraction that can, continues to strive to, uh, to attract people to this city. And it's, it's a, one of those success stories. We not only honor the, all branches of the military who have served overseas and, and, and are still serving, 
but it's the men and the women of the home front. We, we, we uh, recognize the history and heritage of Brantford and Brant County and Six Nations. We're something of an anomaly for a museum because where we have survived inception with no paid staff, we're all volunteers. That's the heart of the organization. It's easy to open a museum. The hard part is evolving and promoting it for 30 years to make it as much visitors, as, as many visitors post on our Google business page, a real gym. And this is something that we should probably pass on to uh, the people at, uh, at City Hall, a real gym, a must see museum, something to see. So people could come to Brantford for, for this benefit. It's a benefit to the city. Um, almost all artifacts have been generously donated by families and veterans. And there's so many artifacts and so many stories our challenge, like so many other uh, cultural and heritage organizations, is to preserve these artifacts and tell the stories so as to continue the, vis uh, the vision and the legacy of people like Derek Pite for future generations. We're up to it. The future's looking good. We look forward to having neighbors join us down there. We're the orphans down there on that property, whether it be cultural, heritage, educational, or residential, with cooperative communication, and planning the community will be better for it. People of Brantford, and especially, like I said, the people of Eagle Place have deserved this for a long time. It's a real success story and we're hoping for many more. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'll see if there's just any quick questions. Seeing none, okay, thank you, Mr. I. The next presentation will be from the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre. The Canadian, the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre has a lease agreement that facilitates their proposal to utilize two acres surrounding the Cockshut office and timekeepers structures. They have a partnership with Brand Theatre Workshops Tonight, Peter Muir, the executive director of Brand Theatre Workshop and a board member of the CIHC will give this presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't ordinarily be doing this presentation. We have a president, uh, Dr. Christina Hahn, uh, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, actually, she's a curator at the ROM and uh, she curates the Korean display and uh, that's on tour to Ottawa so she's setting it up in Ottawa and uh, so she leaned on me to uh, do it we have a number of board members here um, but I've been selected so here we go <laughs> um, my name is Peter Muir and I live in Eagle Place at the corner of Ninth and Whitehead um, I am the artistic director of Brandt Theatre Workshops and a board member of the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre the uh, Canadian, the CIHC was formed to bring awareness to Canadians' industrial past, and we currently have a lease for two acres at 66 Mohawk. And there you go, there's the beautiful building there that we um, have a lease to. <laughs> we don't, we, we've been in it a couple of times, uh, but, uh, but it needs work, and I'm glad to hear that the city is taking it on. That's really really important for the, for the last vestiges of our industrial heritage in that area. So um, the Mohawk Greenwich lands, they took a long time to degrade. And it's gonna take years and years of healing to bring that back. We know that. Our tour organizations, CIHC and Brand Theater Workshops are currently located in a share studio uh, in Eagle Place. We are right next to the, uh, to the military museum and they're doing great work. And we've got a little industrial space right next door. So we're invested in this community. The Mohawk Greenwich lands are important to, to me as a member of the Eagle Place community. Uh, an interesting fact that we have uh, uncovered through our research, the earliest reference to Eagle Place comes from the island that Joe Twofish lived on. And he let everybody know that eagles were nesting there. So uh, we have strong indigenous roots there 
Our name comes from, uh, from Joe Two Fish. So uh, interesting fact anyways. Um, I drive by that brownfield every single day. And I see the rusted fencing, the tumbled blue um, containers, the, the holes in the ground, the scarred industrial lands. And every time I think our community really needs to change that. Boy, that doesn't represent Eagle Place at all. Um, despite that black hole of the Mohawk Greenwich brownfield, the area has actually been good for our theater company. Uh, let's see, oh, we'll go back. There we go. This is our last play. And this was done at the Canadian uh, Military Heritage Museum. Uh, and it was The Foot Locker by local uh, reporter Vincent Ball. So uh, that was a great place to do it. And they were very good and people really enjoyed it. Um, the year before we performed, performed Ancient Roots it was a play about First Nations and food sovereignty at Bellevue Community Hall. Prior to that, we performed Summer Breeze at the Woodland Cultural Center. And as well, we performed Generations, uh, a play based on the residential school memories of Six Nations elders. And uh, a number of our, we, we have a number of members of our company who belong uh, to a group called the BTW First Nations Collective. And so we create shows uh, together. And that was one of the shows we did um, recently. Um, we've toured that uh, internationally and we've toured it locally as well. Now, um, how does the CIHC and Brand Theatre Workshops work together. In 2019, we started with a focus on Brantford's Jewish community. Together with the Brant Historical Society and Laurier University, we created the Memories of Brantford's Immigrant Communities projects. The day-long event features a historical exhibit, walk, documentaries, an original play, music, and food. And so far, we've explored the immigrant experiences of Jewish, Italian, Chinese, and now the Ukrainian community. Our next event, a preview of the Memories Project of Brantford's Ukrainian community, will be held uh, March 25th at the Slavic Church in Eagle Place. And I would encourage you to come out and have some Ukrainian food and music and hear our reading of our, our play that we've developed. Uh, Also, along with the Brantford District Labor Council and the Eagle Place Community Association, we are producing the Roots of Eagle Place. And that's a series of signs along with research published in an online archive. And that's the kind of work you don't see from a museum. Uh, the museum, you see the displays, but you don't actually see the work that goes into the exhibits. Uh, so this is the preliminary work for a larger work that we're, we're gonna come up with. So the Canadian Industrial Heritage Center and Brand Theater Workshops has a vision for 66 Mohawk. We're working with Brantford architect, Craig Newsom and MMC Architects, and they've provided us with these renderings of what our vision might be. This large metal structure here has the proportions of the old cockshut office. While we couldn't build a new cockshut office, we thought we could replicate it at a, at a significantly lower cost. Um, so that is going to provide an outdoor area that can be used it for performances and events. As you know, with our theater company, we uh, do a summer at the Bell Homestead called the Bell Summer Theater Festival. So we have quite the experience of performing outdoors and we hope to bring that to Eagle Place. Uh, it, this is Witchwood Barnes in Toronto. So we kind of have a vision in the future that we'd like it to be like that, a place for people to gather. Um, the interior of the building will have a small theater slash lecture hall that will open out onto the outdoor amphitheater. 
The exhibition hall will contact connect with the time office and it will allow for revolving exhibitions. We're planning on a phased approach to the property. First, with the help of the city, restoring the facades, capping the property, and possibly erecting a tent to begin our performances and events. The next phase, we would be, be constructing the metal structure and the parking lot and a small support facility. And then in the final phase, we would construct the building and the parkland around it. Again, as someone who lives and works in Eagle Place community, I would like to see healing here, healing in all ways, with all communities. And, you know, I think it's going to take a long time, but this is a project really worth doing. Thank you. Peter, just before Peter leaves, um, I'll see if there's any one or two quick questions for. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. The next presentation will be from the Lansdowne Children's Center, who has a memorandum of, of understanding with the city to explore the potential relocation of their education facility to the district. The executive director, Rita Marie Hadley, and Rob Nagy, a parent of a Lansdowne client, will give this presentation. You can begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. I, I'd also like to introduce myself as someone who was raised in my father's house is still around the corner from Mohawk Park. So this is something that's really important to me too, driving past that on the way to, to, to his place and a place of my growing up. Connection to and my place. connection to the lovely area. Growing up as a kid, I spent probably 95% of my time at my grandmother's house on uh, Whitehead and 8th Ave. Um, I remember when Slovak Village was created and built and uh, I just love everything about the area. So driving by there's, we need it to heal. Is, is someone able to put my slide deck up there? I don't know that I have the power from this to do that, but, but I realize I have five minutes. So maybe I'll start talking because actually the, the story of Lansdowne Children's Center is, is a history of our community. Uh, we are located in uh, what it was formerly the Jane Laycock School, which had its roots uh, if with the uh, family of the Cockshut family and uh, Jane Laycock being Jane Cockshut and the, the care for kids uh, in our community who, who have needs is what has been at the root of Lansdowne Children's Center. Quickly to recap for people who may not be aware of the organization, it, it, began, a, it began as the Rotary Crippled Children's Center, it was centered in the Brantford General Hospital, but its movement out of there was because it outgrew its space and that's been its history. Uh, it supports kids who live with physical communication or developmental challenges or who will be recovering from illness or injury. It's, it's about our kids reaching their potential and they may have significant odds, but every unique goal for each individual is really important to our organization. So this, the success of Lansdowne expanding services over time has the trade-off that now so many kids are waiting for services in a building Lansdowne has outgrown. And if you look at the staggering statistics in this community, the numbers on that board of the amount of families and children requiring Lansdowne services is staggering, it's terrifying, and it needs to be resolved. I have a 11 month old son. He's been on a wait list for about eight months. He's finally going to be benefiting from the services that Lansdowne provides on February 8th. Our kids are our future and every child deserves the benefit of accessing service. And Lansdowne's footprint cannot accommodate the need in this community. And that's why it needs to expand and grow and make sure every family 
and every child in this community that needs help will get it. The good news is we've been able to grow. Uh, the number of individuals that are providing the services and the number of kids we've served has grown. The part that's not good is the kids who are waiting and the length of time they wait. So things we can't do there are, are the, the struggles and the frustrations. We have state-of-the-art abilities. We've had research published and we've had teams come from Singapore to look at the Lansdowne approach for our services, but we're not being able to, to do justice to our local families who need that. And the fact that the projection of the growth, because as was commented, we are growing, that's just adding to the wait list and the pressure. So we, we feel strongly about the need to move forward and looking at the opportunity. We have been working on plans for some time. We had several scenarios. We got as far as blueprints and, and a plan for a hub, but we lost both of those opportunities. So we're now focusing on what lands down alone needs because of the numbers of kids we serve. We're fairly large and because it's an ambulatory hospital that we're classified as, it needs space. It can't be done in counseling space. It's a range of physically and technologically based services. So you see our whole timeline. We have been progressing and that is good news, but good news can't include so many kids waiting that they almost eclipse as many as we are able to serve each year. Now, regardless of how closely the final design resembled architect's rendering, the reality is that the new building will reduce wait times, make services easier to access. I don't know if you've ever needed to use Lansdowne services, but the road that we are located on is unsafe. There's no parking, there's no access for families, let alone staff members. Uh, it'll improve the range of rehabilitation services for children and youth with special needs in Brantford and surrounding areas. And we believe that this will form an amazing part of the Eagle Place and East Ward community and is going to be something that will just enhance and embrace everything and give you access where it's not unsafe to go there because you're afraid to cross the street, a very, very busy street. And I will note that since we first shared this design, which was uh, based upon the requirement that there would be a slab on grade, so it would respect the conditions of the remediation of the site, we have had to do some recosting because this has been a proposal that has been waiting and we've had COVID in the meantime, so we've had to recost it. We had to try to be uh, growth proofing it by putting a shell floor, a fourth floor shell. We had to, in order to cut costs, remove a fourth floor shell and also cut out a pool. However, we still believe that we can get approval on uh, what the pand post-pandemic price tag is and still be able to bring this to the community. So those are being some of the compromises because we don't want kids to have to wait any longer. In my next slide, I point out that we've worked with uh, Didois de Desnes, uh, who will follow us to present because we've both been looking at this site and have approached city council around the same time about how we could collaborate. And the architects working together, reoriented, Lansdowne architect reoriented so we could share the land and be very uh, respectful of the space. It, it augments the green space when we face each other, but it also means we can be flexible about parking so that when either has overflow, we can make sure we make the best use of it because no one needs any empty unused space. We know that for sure. Finally, we, we want this to be a place that also with a clean, uh, I don't know if we'll swim in it, but having the clean Mohawk Lake, we also want our kids of the future to be proud of it. And we want the neighborhoods who make use of the service to be really proud of this being in the neighborhood. So happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I see some hands in the room. We'll allow some questions. Good evening. My name is Debbie Gerard. I also live in Eagle Place. My mother was raised there. I was raised there, raised my kids there. My question for you is, if you acquire this space to build your Lansdowne Center, would you be able to make it big enough and um, wide enough to accommodate all that you need so that you don't have to keep moving and moving and moving? And secondly, we would be very happy to be your neighbor. <laughs> 
Well, certainly uh, we have been supported by our ministry, our main funder to do space planning. So it's not us doing, I mean, we know we're crowded. We, we were able to hire functional programming planners who said for the number of staff we have and for the children in our population who have the needs for our services, what's the standard amount of space you need for your activities? And so it was based upon their work that they project the space requirements. And then the architects came in to say, this is how we could translate it. And the same architects who worked with us to develop that concept, they designed the Ron Joyce Children's Center in Hamilton. It was built on a remediated brownfield. And they also did the design for the Grandview Children's Center, which is currently being built in Durham region. So we know that it's the right planning professionals who could look at contemporary use of space. And we would be including uh, the capacity to be flexible about our space. So we know over time there's new conditions requiring our services, but we also have uh, discoveries and, and approaches, which mean there, our, our work will probably change over time. We had hoped by a fourth floor shell, we would have that future proofing. As with how the government funds schools, they are not, they're reluctant to fund for future capacity. However, this is give, giving us an appropriate evidence based start for that. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll, we will um, save any other questions for the last question period. Thank you, you both. Our next presenters are joining us virtually. The Dedua de Desne Aboriginal Health Centre is also working with uh, working on a memorandum of understanding with the city to explore the potential relocation of their existing health facility and offices to the district. They will be represented by Joanne Matina, acting CEO, and Alex Jacobs Blum, board capital lead. Please go ahead when you're ready. Excellent. Scano, my name is Alex Jacobs Bloom. I'm Laura Cuga Nation, Wolf Clan of Six Nations, and I'm the chair of the Capital Development Committee at Data Wada Desne Aboriginal Health Center. And I'm joined today with Joanne Matina, and maybe I'll just pass it to Joanne to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Joanne Matina. I am the acting CEO for Data Wada Desne. I am a settler descent, and I strive to be an ally to the Indigenous community through the work that I'm doing, not only with the Data Wada Desne Aboriginal Health Center, but in my personal life as well and through my personal journey and growth. Back to you, Alex. Amazing. Next slide, please. This year, we're celebrating 25 years of operating in Brantford. Data Wada Disney has been successfully providing culturally safe programs and services that are relationship-based, welcoming, and individual-directed. Many of our programs include primary care, mental health, health promotion programs, and they are well sought after. For many years, Data Wada Desne has been operating in a space that is too small to house all the programs and services, and we're proposing to expand to create a community well-being center. And we envision the community well-being center to be a place of celebration of culture and a space that demonstrates a deep respect for tradition. A uh, connection to the community, including themes of healing, wellness, and restorative powers, economic sustainability, training, and employment, a legacy space for Brantford communities and Indigenous persons, and lastly, a space for inclusiveness with a welcoming environment and culture. Next slide, please. Data Wada Desne is currently operating from a space at 36 King Street, which is poorly accessible, and the building is inadequate to house the current programs. Our proposed program is too large to fit within the existing site, and zoning will not allow the size of the building to fit our proposed program. The building is outdated along with building systems. Uh, the current space is not conducive to the integration of traditional and Western medicine, and it isn't aligned with best practice space standards along with infection control standards. There also aren't opportunities for outdoor ceremonial space, garden, or lodge. Next slide, please. Data Wada Desne is planning for a new location for the health center. And we recognize that there was an opportunity to do more and better through collaboration. And as a result, the concept for an indigenous hub to provide a culturally safe space for indigenous peoples in, Br in Brantford began to take shape. And we approached a few organization organizations who are interested and share this vision as well. Brantford Native Housing in partnership with Ontario Aboriginal Housing, Niagara Peninsula Aboriginal Area Management Board, 
Nawasa Kandaswintag, Brantford Regional Indigenous Support Center, and Agua Deni Dao. Next slide, please, and I'll pass it off to Joanne. Thank you, Alex. And throughout our capital planning, we have met continually with the city and council of the city of Brantford to discuss our uh, interest within the lands uh, starting as early as 2015, where we ex formally expressed an interest in space in what was then known as the Mohawk Greenwich Brownfield, and then following it up with an application in 2018, where we did submit a formal application to the city of Yant uh, Brantford, sorry, for the use of the land on the Mohawk Lake District. Um, as Tara mentioned, in the spring of 2021, the City Council did pass a motion to allow City staff to begin uh, the negotiations of an MOU to develop an agreement of purchase and sale, for which we are very grateful. Next slide, please. So the next steps in our capital process is to confirm the site spacing. We are working with architects to ensure that the site spacing will be adequate for the current programs and services and allow for growth over the years as well so that we aren't going to have to be looking for space continually. And as we design, we'll be looking at making uh, the building that we're currently on be able to be able to grow if for future expansion if needed. Um, we were, as Alex mentioned, we are also uh, developing those partnerships with some of the potential partners that we've mentioned. We're formalizing what that could look like in the agreements and the governance structure of how we'll all work together. And then after that, we're going to begin our site design. And that's a very exciting because we're not only going to be planning for our current generation and the current work that we're doing, but we're going to be planning for seven generations out at least. Um, Next slide, please. So our vision for the Wellbeing Center is a one-stop shop for Indigenous people where organizations can come together to provide a bundle of services focused on improving the social, of, social determinants of health for Indigenous people living in the city of Brantford. This is a conceptual model and it's just an overall rendering of how it could fit on this space. Next slide, please. Now, we recognize that um, this is a conceptual model. It can change. This is just looking at how we could put the different aspects of the well-being center into a picture to make it understandable for us and for our partners as we go forward. So in this diagram, you would see that this tealy green color here would be like the house center. The purple would be childcare offered through Nawasa Kandasa and Tag. The blue would be some mixed commercial and um, yellow, it would be the housing operated either through Brand for Native Housing or um, Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. And when we're talking housing units, we're talking about 40 to uh, 45 uh, fair market value rental units that we're looking at. Next slide, please. And this is just another kind of uh, way that we're showing the diagram. It is just broken out a little bit differently and turned. But that's basically what we have. So I'm not sure at this point if um, we want to continue on for questions or if we want to reserve questions for later. Thank you. I will open the floor to one or two quick questions if there are any. I see one hand raised in the room. Hi, thank you. I'm just wondering, um... To be honest, why do you not have more land? Like why why do we more land being offered so you can put more things? Like, why is it that specific size of land? Was this something you negotiated with them, or was this what they were saying? This is all you've got to use. Uh, well, this where we're located is right, kind of across the way from the parkland. So we would plan on looking at being able to utilize some of that park space as well. And also recognizing that there are limitations to the space that is available in the Mohawk Lake District. So based off of the sizing of our projections, this is what we can see that we're going to be needing. We'd always take more space if available, but we also know that space is always at a premium as well. But thank you for that. One more quick question. Um, yes, this question is, uh, perhaps you would want to use more space and I'm thinking, what about the glebe lands? 
Have you ever considered using them or is it possible? Um, so the Glebe lands, I believe, are owned by Six Nations, and that is a reserve uh, property. We are here to serve the urban Indigenous population of the city of Brantford. That is our mandate. So we actually are not able to, through our funding agreements with the Ministry of Health, to be located on reserve land. Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you both for your presentation. And if there are any other questions, we still have one more question period. Thanks again. Our final presentation from a community organization will be the Survivor Secretariat. The Mohawk Lake District has been identified as an area of interest for their work. Scott Robertson will represent the Survivor Secretariat and give some information. Please go ahead when you're ready. Can you hear me? Okay, um, I would just like to begin by thanking the organizers, Tara Tran and the City of Brantford for allowing us to speak tonight and creating a safe space for us to be here. My name is Scott Robertson. Um, I come from two communities. My mother's from Six Nations and my dad grew up on uh, Sherwood Avenue just over in West Brant. So uh, Brantford has a special place in my heart. Um, I represent the Survivor Secretariat. I am a lawyer and um, Survivor Secretariat is exactly that. There are survivors who survived residential school. Um, they're not a political organization, so I'm not representing either the traditional or the elected council from Six Nations. I represent the Secretariat. And so what we do is we further the mandate. And their mandate is very simple in terms of what they're asking, but very difficult in terms of delivering. And what their mandate is, is to return the children back to their rightful place. And so for those of you who know, don't know, in the shadow of this development, um, the largest uh, and, and most, uh, I would say, longest serving residential school in Canada operated within that shadow. And so two years ago, Canada was awakened to the realization from Kamloops' experience that there are several thousands, perhaps, children buried in unmarked graves across Canada. And so for the survivor secretary here at Six Nations, their goal and their mandate and these are people who have survived the residential school experience. The humility in which they carry out their services is incredible. But their goal is to make sure that all of those children are located. So what I'm asking tonight is not so much of a presentation, but a request. And so I understand and I appreciate in terms of the stories that were told tonight. And when I woke up this morning, I was very excited because I saw snow on the ground. And in our culture, snow represents winter. And winter is a time for telling stories. And the reason why you tell stories in the wintertime when the snow is on the ground is so you don't disturb the spirits. Think about that. The presentation tonight is with respect to disturbing spirits. And so while development is encouraged, and, and I, I, I can empathize with those of you who came forward tonight and shared your stories, your personal interests, and you talked about relationships, you talked about healing both the environment the relationships in the community. And in considering those decisions that you're gonna make with respect to development, I would encourage you to consider the healing from a Six Nations perspective and specifically the Survivor Secretariat. So moving forward, it's important that we consider that, giving a voice to the people in this community who have never had one. And when we talk about telling stories, let's tell some real stories the voice of a community that was silenced. An Indian act was thrust upon them. Their children were stolen from their homes and forced into a residential school setting. We now have records that can confirm that there are over 57 nations, 50 different, 57 different nations from across Ontario, Quebec, whose children were taken and brought to this community and forced to attend that residential school. So it's not only Six Nations children that we're talking about. We have a responsibility to those communities as well. And so while the mandate that was put forward with respect to this project is talking about welcoming, making it welcoming for those people who come into that community, honoring the past and inspiring the future, those are very strong commitments to the Survivor Secretariat. We've got a lot of work to do in being able to honor that past commitment. So I come to you not with a threat, not with making anyone want to feel bad about this purpose, but just stopping and reflecting 
while you're making these decisions, these decisions to make Brantford a better place, to give opportunities for these associations and organizations to thrive, organizations that need space, that need healing and provide healing powers to the community. Consider where the survivor secretariat are coming from and support them in their role. Stop, pause and consult and take advice and direction for the first time in survivor secretaries lives, give them a voice and a purpose. So I thank you for your time tonight and your pause. And I look forward to working with you in a positive relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. We have time for questions now. So again, um, in light of the fact that I did not open the floor to the virtual participants earlier, I'll start with any virtual participants who have questions. Okay. Um, just a reminder to those who are participating virtually that if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand in the Zoom function and we will acknowledge you. Otherwise, I will turn it to the floor here. Are there any other questions? Please, please go ahead. <clears throat> so I have to confess, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but what I'm trying to understand about this development is we're trying to do all these different things at once. And a lot of what I'm hearing is even in the, I know it's the initial plan, but even the initial plan, the types of residences that are going in, the types of commercial sites that are going in, I have to ask the question is, how do I say this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to say this politely. When offering a certain type of residential space, you in turn promote a certain type of resident. And unfortunately, we all know this, and I'm not trying to be insensitive, but those that rent don't often, for whatever reason you want to call it, take pride in that property, take pride in the environment they're in. Where I live, I have affordable housing that runs right behind me. And a lot of those residents, unfortunately, um, don't take care of their property, don't take pride. And this seems to be the reoccurring theme that everyone's talking about is this new site is built for pride for for joy for renewal for healing and i can't I, I, I can't help but just ask that obvious question then why is it not offered why do we have to have commercial and residential on top of each other we have lots of places in brantford where we have single dwelling homes with with commercial site centered west brant for example this is a great opportunity i think here to redirect a lot of that because when you start offering the commercial here we have that already at eagle place and again not trying to be impolite to anyone but but unfortunately those residences that are there don't always take pride in that environment they don't take pride in the city they don't take pride in the streets they just don't take pride so i'm asking you is there any way to put in the amendment request residential maybe not specifically commercial with can we not just maybe think about the idea of redeveloping it so it's loan individual houses that offers that brings in people who are going to take more pride in their property and the land and then in turn show what we want for all these presentations is respect for that land yeah, thanks for your question so um as, as part of the official plan amendment we're permitting the use of housing so that could be standalone residential buildings or mixed use buildings now i want to be clear that yet yeah, the official plan amendment cannot regulate whether houses are rented or sold. So it could be rental, it could be condo. We don't have that control. It's not, it's not uh, permitted under provincial legislation. That's not something that we can do. But when we're talking about like a mixed use building, that could very well be condo units above those commercial units. So somebody could own those, like that, an individual unit. It's not um, like a done deal that because there's commercial on the ground floor, there would be rental units above. So um, what the official plan amendment is doing is just permitting the land uses. So uh, housing is something that is permitted. Again, it could be, could be rental, it could be condo. Um, and then in, in terms of, I'm just going to add about, you know, the types of buildings we're, we're anticipating here. Um, this is really a, a 
a prime area for redevelopment. And I think that, you know, adding those commercial uses can really bring some vibrancy to this area. Um, you know, there's going to, one of the key features is that really large park and the waterfront promenade and uh, having those, that mix of uses is going to make that a complete community that we wouldn't be able to achieve with just standalone residential uses. Yep. Thank you. So my name is Nicole Wilmot. I'm the Director of Planning and Development Services. So thank you very much for your question. And it's um, so just to kind of build off of it, what Victoria is saying, I think what we we absolutely hear your concerns and, and we recognize that there are concerns and a lot of them may be, may be shared with with some of the people that are here this evening with respect to what that housing is ultimately going to look like. I think it's important, though, to recognize the stages in terms of where we're at, as, as Victoria has mentioned, in terms of the planning process. Right now, what we're doing is, is we're we're a, we're working towards establishing the land use permissions within this area, which capture residential and capture a broad range of residential. So as we've mentioned, that could be residential and standalone buildings. It could be in mixed use buildings as well as maybe town housing and some other medium uh, to, to low density type housing. The concept with the district plan is the idea that we wanna build a complete community. That's the, in, in order to do that, we need a range of amenities of services within that community. The specific details that you're concerned about will come at the later stages when we're contemplating the zoning in that area. And more specifically, when we're addressing applications for specific housing types within those areas. So much further down the process in terms of where we are with planning. We recognize there are concerns in this in the community around the tenure. As we've said, we're not there yet. The tenure is, is further down the road. We need to first establish the land use permissions that allow for housing. We have staff here that are working on the housing plan, and that is a citywide housing plan. You have ward councillors who have heard very clearly about the types of housing that is desired in this area. They will be taking those concerns and moving them forward. The reason why you're likely not getting the answer that or you're driving the question is because we're just simply not there in the process yet. We've heard you. We're absolutely willing to talk to you, and we can provide some additional contact information and have those conversations, but it's really early days in the process. Thank you, Nicole. I'd like to respond to the question as well. My name is Alan Waterfield, manager of Long Range Planning. I think what you're asking is why is single family or single detached dwellings, you know, individual lots, individual homes with front yards and backyards being considered for this area? Is, is that where you're, you're getting at? Because then, it, you know, those could be sold to owners who will live there. Um, just part of the rationale for why more denser forms of housing are being considered here also has to do with the fact that it is a remediated brownfield site and there are capping requirements for developing on those lands in the future. So to provide areas that, for example, would be front yards or, or backyards would require a lot more fill, which makes that, um, that development model less feasible um, for, for, you know, a development company to come in and put in a street of, or, you know, a cul-de-sac of, of detached houses, as opposed to other um, building models like townhouse development or um, multi-residential development, like um, small-scale apartment buildings. Thank you, Alan. That's a good clarification. I'd like to just make sure some new folks. Yeah. Murray Locke. Um, if I can kind of understand it, uh, it looks like you've been working on this project for 10 years. Lansdowne just made a presentation that they're going to need to build almost tomorrow. And, and I keep hearing that you're not there, you're wherever you're going to be. I mean, I'm 72 years old. I don't really know if this, you're going to get a, anything in the ground in my lifetime. So maybe you guys can help me, but I, I don't get it. You know, like we need to get moving, you know, and this is ridiculous. 
Thank you. I do appreciate your comment. I, none of us in this room are getting any younger as the days and years go on. You know, I can appreciate your comment. Um, there has been obviously a lot of history associated with this project. We have been at it for several years. I recognize the frustration. Um, it's complex. It's complex for the reasons that we heard tonight. It's complex for the history and the past that we've dealt with on this property from the remediation and, and moving forward. There has been an incredible amount of work done on this project. So I appreciate maybe the feeling of being impatient, but we are working towards implementing the plan as the plan has been approved by this community. But we also heard respectfully the request to pause and reflect, and we're doing that as well. So I appreciate your comment, but we're, we're taking it under advisement. Yep, so we've been working closely with Lansdowne as well as with the other groups. We are aware of the timelines and they are also aware of the constraints and the complexities associated with this project. We have continue to work with them. We are making progress. But as we said, there are a lot of issues that need to be considered here before there's ever a shovel in the ground. Well, I can appreciate that. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? I have a question and a comment to all of you. As a child of Eagle Place growing up here, we've always had a dumpy reputation in this ward. And I want to just readmit, I have no problems with what I have seen with Lansdowne, with the Indigenous Center. I grew up across the street from the residential school and don't get me started on that place because I could tell you some stories but to put and I want to make this crystal clear to put housing on this property that is geared to income or whatever you say Eagle Place is not the dump the dump is down the street from Eagle Place Eagle Place has been dumped on my entire 67 years in this community. And I just want to reiterate to you people, I'm tired of it. These buildings are going to up and elevate our Ward 5, and I'm okay with that. But the rest, we need to talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. In light of the time, um, if there's any burning like questions that um, but it, staff are definitely happy to speak with others outside the meeting as well. I'm 81 and I expect to be at the groundbreaking. We, we appreciate uh, I, your help carrying that shovel. <laughs> I, I don't want to whip a dead horse, but as your comment to uh, mass housing being a detriment, and, okay, uh, it's being a mass housing being a detriment to society and a mess and everything else. I disagree. It can it can work. It's how it's implemented. Now, I have plans for this land. I know I was told that I, my plans are no good. They're garbage. Now, four and a half years ago, I had two and a half million dollars promised to me by an individual, as well as he was a fundraiser and he swore he could get me another hundred thousand, hundred. 
Mr. Birch, we'll just ask you to keep on talking. He, well, he, okay, he told me he could get a lot more money. But anyways, that's not the point. If it's implemented properly, this can work. I disagree with the artist concepts that are there now. Yes, and it, 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 could, it could be done very shortly. I have a plan for the pollution. It, it doesn't matter. Okay, Mr. Birch, it, we'll it, just, it can be also, we have a few other questions in the room. We also have some virtual questions as well. Yes, we do have a virtual question um, from Elizabeth Goss. Elizabeth, can you go ahead with your question, please? Yeah, uh, actually, this is John Steinberger, husband. But uh, my question is, is has consideration, there's, it sounds like there'll be a sizable amount of more residents moving to the district. Has consideration be made, been made as to how this might impact the schools, how this might impact the water system, transit system, other systems that we rely on in this neighborhood? Thank you for your question. Uh, that is the exercise that we're going through right now for the draft plan of subdivision or preliminary draft plan of subdivision is fully understanding all the infrastructure requirements, roads, sewers, um, water capacity. Um, and so that will be an exercise that we are um, that we are investigating right now and and more information will be um, available when we're done that investigation this summer. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm going to take one more question um, from the room and then then we'll wrap up. My name is Chris Markell. Uh, in 1986, there was a fire at White Farms. A couple of days after, Dave Levac, Margaret, and Ross Bennett, who was the fire chief, to travel to the site, revisit, looked it over. In 2003, they started Brown Food Company. I was the first member. It's a process. The process is very long. Nicole, Tara, the city, the staff members have done an excellent job. We're here, we started this, I can remember it, it was Brownfield. Then we changed it to Mohawk. This is a process, it doesn't happen overnight. Infrastructure, water, hydro, planning, development, committees, funding. I run 15 social house sites across Ontario. Funding is not there, it's very strong. You can apply for funding. Everything we're doing here has a few lands down, the industrial committee, I remember them come to our committees and proposing and putting in front of us what they have. This does not happen overnight. It's been 20 years, right, Tara? 20 years. And most of the people, Dave Belville, who lived in Eagle Place, has passed away. A couple other members have passed away. The process is not going to be guaranteed. This we still talk in five years or maybe a shovel in five years, but it doesn't happen overnight. And staff has to go through regulations. In the city of Brantford, it's one of the cities I've watched deal with five other municipalities. We're underdeveloped. We're behind. We can't put in high rises downtown Market Street because of the infrastructure is not there. Before you can build new condos, you the infrastructure. You don't have the infrastructure, you can't develop. One of the things the city in the city of Brantford has is we have to build within our boundaries, okay? Greenfield, everybody's knowing what's going to happen there. We're gonna develop farmlands, but we still have to develop in, what is it, 52 acres? Mohawk, 52 acres, you figure it out. I can remember the first plan came out, it was 832, single dwelling units. I've seen so many plans. We've got to keep focus, because stay on target and let the staff members do what they have to do to keep this project moving. Thank okay? you, Chris. Uh, that, no question, I'm mm -hmm. done, okay? Yes, Richard, I know. There's a lot of councils to know. I don't usually talk maybe once in a while. Thank you, Thank you. thanks for that. And once again, thank you for all the community organizations for sharing your updates. And we do appreciate. <laughs>
everyone's patience, your keen interest, your questions, all your comments, we hear them. And as said, we take, we're taking this one step at a time. Um, we also appreciate that the technical challenges we are here, we've had today, but we're also going to improve upon that as well. Um, but we do appreciate everyone being here and taking the time. I'll now turn it over to Councillor Van Tilborg for closing remarks. Wow, so much wisdom in this room and so much online. They asked me, what do you think is gonna happen tonight? Who's gonna come? Is there gonna be anybody here? And I said, I know what happened in the past, but I have no idea what's gonna happen tonight. Tonight, you've all made me proud. You've shown me your passion for the project, for your community, and for everything that we've done. And, you know, I, I hear things like from Chris Markell, who, who just spoke, who's been with this since 2003, following through. And, and I got to tell you, uh, we've seen a lot of plans. We've come a lot of long ways. When I got to council, there wasn't plans on what was going to go in anymore. The other ones were all scrapped. But the whole focus was getting that land remediated. And then we've got these proposals here. And I know when we see the proposals, and I know what you've seen, you see proposals that you love, like, and want for your community. It's really clear. Our job is to make it as possible for all these presentations all of them, they all have an interest. We've got to accommodate them all. And we also have to deal with the fact that we do know there's also pressures on places to, to be built. You've heard it tonight. We've heard it. Staff hears it. We all want to work together on this. What I really enjoy, though, is the fact that you all made this effort to come out tonight. I hope the people on Zoom didn't have like a timer that cuts them off on the two hours because we've gone over our two hours and I hate for them to have been cut off. But I think we're all there, are they not? Everybody's still there? Right on. You know, so with that, um, you've heard everything. Keep in touch with staff. Keep in touch with your counselors, myself and Mandy Samwell. Any other, I know you're not all from Ward 5 and keep in, keep in contact with your own counselors because you want them to support the projects that have been presented here going forward and the interests at stake. It's all beneficial for us all. We Look, I see this stuff and I want it tomorrow. And I want to get it, well, David Newman's gone, but I would like to get it done uh, while he's still here too. So, um, you know, he's, he made his point and uh, he's come out to these meetings. He's been with us for a long time. With that, I'd like to thank staff. This is the first time, I believe, that we've ever done an out of the city virtual meeting and an in-person meeting at the same time. Not too many hiccups. And again, thank you. You've made me proud and I look forward to the future. Thank you, Councillor. Good evening, everyone. The meeting is now adjourned.